Tonight's story was written by author Jesse Pullins and myself. You can find this story and others featured in his new book, Seasonal Halloween Store, available now on Amazon. Check the link in the description for more information. As far back as I could remember, the house had always been abandoned. Growing up, the old place on Lake Wind Drive existed like an open sore amongst the other houses. The shingles were tattered and frayed. The windows that weren't busted out were cloudy and dirty. The yard was overgrown, a decade's worth of neglect piling until the vegetation seemed to want to swallow the house. The neighborhood prayed for it to cave in, but no matter how hard the wind blew or how many times it was buried in snow, the house continued to loom behind the empty driveway. Always standing, always rotting, always watching. Every Halloween, it didn't matter what part of town you were from, notoriously known as the Lakewind House, parents would routinely remind their children, mine included, that the house was strictly off limits. Every time I would ask why, but the excuse was never the same. They would either say the porch is so rotted the boards would break and give you tetanus, or it was a frequent squat for the homeless and they didn't want us to get hurt, or the city had condemned it and the roof was due to fall in at any moment. Each year I would pass the Lakewind house while trick-or-treating, wondering exactly why it was so run down. Why didn't they renovate it or bulldoze it altogether? Standing amongst the other freshly painted homes, the Lakewind house just looked terrible. Like the true meaning of rot. When I was younger, you heard all kinds of rumors about the house. Tall tales spread around the school that would only further discourage the kids from visiting it. Once I heard there was an axe murder there, and a whole family had been chopped up and buried in the walls. Another time I heard they tried to burn it down long ago, and it was simply there the next morning, risen from the ashes. Another time I heard some teenagers had actually snuck in, but they never made it back out. Some say their bones were pulled from their bodies. They got stuck in the attic and suffocated. Like the warnings of my parents to avoid the house, the strange tales were always different. A detail would change. The amount of victims would be larger. The amount of gore would be exaggerated. But amongst the constant changes in the stories we heard, one thing would always stay the same. Nobody ever went into Lakewind House. Ever. Last year, I was too old to trick-or-treat. I had just turned 16, and the thought of going house to house felt embarrassing. There was a bitter sweetness to not wanting to carry the pillowcase anymore, but its absence left something to be desired. I still wanted to get out and have fun, maybe even still dress up in the process, but I wanted to have different fun, more mature fun. I didn't know what I wanted, but I wanted something exciting. My friends felt the same, and it didn't take long for us to fabricate some sort of plan that would probably get us into trouble. I'm the fifth wheel in a group of five, Harold, Audrey, Ethan, and Grace. It's lame, I know, but it's not my fault I had two friends that were girls and two friends that were guys, and they kind of just got together. I was never really concerned with getting a significant other, but it didn't keep me from getting lonely. They were the only friends I had, so I had to choose between being the fifth wheel or being nobody. It was an easy decision, especially when you don't have any other friends. We kicked around the idea of a Halloween party, but we would have had to have been chaperoned by somebody's parents. We thought about going to see a movie, but there wasn't anything good playing, and I really didn't want to sit there while everybody but me made out. Just when it seemed like there wouldn't really be anything to do, Harold came up with an idea that had us all raising our eyebrows. Yeah, what if we went into Lakewind House, all five of us? Nobody shot it down immediately, but I could tell the suggestion made the group uncomfortable. It's like we could all picture the place in our mind, the ominous husk lurking behind the tall, unkempt grass. When nobody spoke up, Harold continued. Heard a rumor a couple weeks back there was some kind of treasure in there, like an old trunk or something. Just yesterday somebody said there's people buried under the stairs. We hear stuff like this all the time, it's probably a joke like everything else, Grace said, shaking her head. Yeah, I know, Harold nodded sheepishly. But if there was something cool in there and we took a picture of it, or grabbed something as a souvenir, that would be pretty legendary, wouldn't it? The boys grinned and the girls kind of hugged themselves, the weight of the idea feeling very real the longer we talked about it. 
sneaking off into the woods or to a friend's house was one thing. But the Lakewind house? I got the feeling that nobody wanted to go, but no one wanted to be the one that chickened out. When nobody did, the plans just started to make themselves. Especially when Ethan mentioned his older brother could get us beer. Come on, guys. I think it'd be pretty cool. Ethan chimed in, nudging me in the shoulder. Have a beer or two, snoop around a little. There's a homeless guy or something. We'll just nope out of there. In the end, we cultivated a plan that covered all of our bases, and bought enough time to actually get in there without our parents getting worried. Ethan and I would stay over at Harold's place for a video game LAN party, and Grace would stay at Audrey's. Harold's dad had to work late that night, so he wouldn't see us getting in later than usual. Grace and Audrey told their parents they would go shopping, and since Audrey was the only one allowed to borrow her parents' car, they could pretend to get held up in town. It was foolproof, really. We could sneak in, maybe take some pictures, and dip out before anyone noticed. We would go after trick-or-treating was over, so nobody would notice us walking up. In the end, we started to get pumped up, fighting off the excitement of the oncoming thrill. Like we were going to do something bad. A feeling that seemed to scream at us silently when it came time to actually go in. Standing there with Harold and Ethan, I couldn't help but feel my skin crawl. The trick-or-treaters were gone, leaving nothing but empty, quiet streets. Even when Audrey parked down the road and her and Grace joined us on foot, we couldn't help but gawk at the old house from the cracked sidewalk. The five of us stood there looking at it with forced smiles, each exchanging a look to the miserable shell of a home within the jungle of weeds. A house that seemed to look back. We all seemed on edge until we saw Ethan dig into his backpack and flash us a glimpse of a six-pack of cans, a devilish grin on his face. I remember thinking it wouldn't be so bad. Houses weren't really haunted. People didn't stack corpses in the walls and cover them up with drywall. And they definitely didn't leave behind a stash of invaluable treasure. But the beer was cool. Without much of a word, Harold headed in the direction of the house, Audrey coming along reluctantly on his hip. Ethan reshouldered his backpack and motioned for Grace's hand, which she blushed and took. As I watched them go, I couldn't help but look up at the house with disdain. There was a window just below the ridge of the roof that must have been an attic of some kind. I thought of the rumors over the years and the unbelievable sightings people claimed to see in the window. Sometimes they'd see a posed mannequin, an old woman staring out, or a disembodied head. I didn't see anything. You coming? Grace asked, looking back at me. Yeah, man, let's go. Well, it's cold. Harold whispered, motioning to the backpack with his thumb. I looked around nervously and followed, the streets feeling darker and eerier as I stepped onto the property. Harold and Audrey moved quickly, looking around cautiously before trying the front door. The knob turned, but the door wouldn't budge. Uh, it's stuck, almost like it's glued shut. Maybe we try around back, Audrey suggested, who was already pulling away to lead. She looked excited, and I could feel the same nervous thrill welling inside me. We followed close behind, watching our steps through the unruly weeds that fought to consume the house. Aside from being severely overgrown, there wasn't much to the backyard. No little playground or shed, only the same wavy grass that danced across the property. It was dark, and the lack of light made things worse. The house was worse up close. Every rusted nail or crack in the paint really showed the years of neglect. A nagging feeling in my gut told me we should really leave, but I pushed it off, thinking maybe that's just how it felt when you were doing something you shouldn't. But the further we went, the more everyone seemed giddy with excitement. With the light fading fast and the adrenaline rising, our steps of progress came in a blur of hushed whispers and reckless decisions. I see the back door. Shit, it's locked. With a chain? Wow. You guys see that? Is that a window? Think we should break it? Break it? Seriously? Maybe it's open. No way. Why would they chain the door shut and leave the window unlocked? Who knows, man? I think I can fit. I'll go first. Ladies first. Grace, are you sure? Come on, we made it this far. We watched silently as Grace climbed in, the darkness of the house swallowing her as we looked around nervously. This is so fucked, Audrey said. She'll be fine, Ethan said, watching intently. For a second, Grace disappeared, 
After a moment, we saw her phone light up, and with it, her reflection. I'm gonna try to unlock the front door. Meet me around front. Be careful, babe. Never. We hurried around front, each of us exchanging glances anxiously. The porch creaked under us as we approached the door, each of us listening for Grace to make it to the front. But we couldn't hear anything. No rattling of the door, nothing moving around inside. Audrey bit her lip, and Ethan tried to look through the dirty windows. We couldn't hear anything. Just the whisper of the wind through the trees. Boo! Everyone jumped as Grace yanked open the door, throwing up her hands for dramatic effect. She motioned for us to go inside, standing out of the way while we filed in, and she giggled from the startle. Door wasn't even locked, she said, closing it behind us once we were in. The atmosphere of the house was congested and stagnant, and a thick aroma of mildew and dust hung on the air. Weird, Harold said, looking over the door himself once Grace stepped away. The first thing that struck me about the house was the overall lack of furniture. It had some odds and ends, yeah, but none of it obeyed the layout of your average home. Where the floor wasn't littered with long-faded newspapers and miscellaneous trash, it was cluttered awkwardly with things that didn't belong. An empty fireplace with a lamp stand scooted in front of it. An old 90s blender on the floor by the stairs. A coffee table, tilted up and resting against the wall. It was like someone had planned to move in, but placed everything in random places. Then there was the wind. A faint whistling of the current fighting its way through every failure in the infrastructure. Our silent, eerie listening was interrupted by the crack of a chilled can. Ethan had already pulled one of the beers from the cluster of six. His head held back while he drank through long sips. He winced immediately afterwards, shaking his head as the flavor hit him. It's, uh, fantastic. Who wants one? He asked, holding them up. I raised my hand, as did Grace. Harold did as well, but said he had to take a leak first. I don't know if it was his way of defiantly taking the lead and exploring a little on his own, or he had just been holding it a while. Either way, we shrugged and watched him go down the hall as he navigated with his phone's flashlight. Audrey watched him go before reaching out for a can, and proceeded to pull the tab. The pop was loud, echoing through the house almost louder than Ethan's. Something that made me open mine as quietly as possible. The can hissed angrily before I popped it open, and I took a long drink of my first beer as a teenager. It tasted like pee. Carbonated pee. I champed through a couple more drinks and ultimately set it down on the floor, putting my hands in my pockets as we took in the inside of the abandoned house. Each of us panned the room with our phones, trying to find something interesting in the oppressive dark. There was only a faint haze of blue through the windows as the sun died down for the night. Grace mentioned there might be a raccoon hiding somewhere in the house, as she had heard something scurry up the stairs as she made her way to the front door. I made a mental note to keep an eye out for it, keeping cool as I reined in my irrational fear of rodents. Another light flashed in the dark room, a flickering glow Audrey was trying to maintain in her hands by her face. Breath cigarettes? Ethan tisked, shaking his head. Audrey shrugged and puffed on the cherry before holding it out for Grace. She looked guiltily at Ethan before taking it. Unbelievable, he said under his breath, crossing his arms. I still had them from the last party at Tanner's. They were in my purse, I figured why not, Audrey said, exhaling into the dark. Come on, we're supposed to be having fun, don't be such a sourpuss, Grace mocked before taking a drag. Just gross is all. Have your fun, Ethan shrugged and the girls giggled. Audrey offered me one and I pulled it out of the pack. Despite Ethan's scowl, I lit it, for show mostly. I kept it at my side and let it burn out as we resumed our search, going to work again with the flashlights. Ethan finished the rest of his beer and crushed the can in his hand, and the girls rolled their eyes at him. The living room was void of decoration, but each wall was heavily stained. Ethan muttered something about how it was probably water damage, and it happened to old houses like this. We left the living room and continued on to what we thought was the dining room, although the only furniture in this room was a rocking chair faced in the corner and an empty fish tank. The aroma of uncleanliness only got worse, one that I thought was coming from the kitchen. Rotting food and mold, maybe. But when we got to the kitchen, the placement of things left behind by the people that owned it made less and less sense. There was no refrigerator in the kitchen or a stove, I shined my light on the sink, expecting to find a mess, but found anything but. 
The sink was relatively clean. Even the dishes left beneath the faucet were pretty strange. A single clean plate, a rolling pin, and a can opener. There was something else underneath the drain, but I couldn't quite see it. I snubbed out my cigarette on the sink's rim and tossed it away before motioning them over. The three of them crept over and crowded around each consecutive phone light bouncing off the sink's interior. Underneath the drain was what looked like an eyeball that had been left out in the sun. The girls gasped, and Ethan and I looked at each other. Half of me was scared, the other half wondering if it had been planted somehow. What the fuck? Ethan started, but was interrupted. Above us there was a loud thud. It was so loud it shook the floor beneath us. Are you a raccoon? Ethan asked, and Grace held up a worried hand to shush him. You think it was Harold? Trying to prank us? Grace asked, and even though she was playing it off, I could tell she was worried. I mean... I started, but the three of them were already heading towards the stairs. Harold? Grace called faintly, as we stared at the darkness of the stairs above. Audrey shined her light impatiently, illuminating the space. A single tennis ball sat close to the edge of the top step, covered in a heavy layer of dust. I expected it to bounce down the stairs, but it was almost like it was frozen in place. Not funny, man, Ethan yelled, loud enough for it to echo through the whole house. After seconds of silence, we looked at each other again and swallowed hard. The slamming noise that followed was loud enough to rattle the windows. We all jumped at the sound, and I felt an icy crawl across my nerves. Without a word, Ethan bolted up the stairs. Ethan, wait! Audrey called, reaching out. She and Grace exchanged a look before going up after him, and the stairs creaked under every step. I decided to follow, not wanting to be the only one left behind. Ethan's, Audrey's, and Grace's silhouettes moved in front of me in a jolty smear as I tried to use my light to see. At the top of the landing, we took a right, one that led us down a small hallway in the upstairs bedrooms. Ethan was frozen in place, and the girls stopped behind him. You gotta be shitting me, Ethan said, his light trained ahead. At the end of the hall was an old wooden folding ladder, leading directly to the attic. Harold, come on, man, Ethan yelled, the loudest he had been since we came in. Together we crept toward it, shining our beams up and around to try to get the best view. I expected something to jump out at us. But there was nothing but the consuming darkness and particles of dust. You think he's up there? I asked. Nobody answered. This is so fucked, Harold. You better not be messing around. Audrey called out, clearly upset. Scared, even. Should we get out of here? Grace said, her voice slightly trembling. Ethan started to move, and we followed. He took a deep breath and started up the ladder, each heavy step kicking up dust. It was silent for a moment before he called down to us with a hesitant but amused tone. Guys, you gotta come see this. We looked at the ladder and asked what, but he didn't elaborate. There was a collective sigh before Audrey went up. I followed, with Grace picking up the rear. The same stale aroma started to get worse the further up we went. And the atmosphere itself felt tainted. It was like a combination of dust and vinegar. As soon as I hit the top of the ladder, I could see Ethan and Audrey, each looking at something on the far end of the attic. They weren't moving, only hunched under the low ceiling and holding their light ahead so everyone could see. I climbed to my feet and moved so Grace could get in, ducking so I didn't hit my head. My eyes were transfixed on it immediately, and once Grace climbed up, I felt her pause behind me. Sitting against the far end of the attic was an old chest that looked like an antique. It was covered in dust and grime, but I could see that beneath years of neglect were intricate brass details and embellishments. The chest reminded me of something from a game of Dungeons and Dragons, and I realized I was thinking of a mimic. Those treasure chests that were actually monsters in disguise. I pictured it opening, and instead of gleaming jewels and gold pieces inside, there were long teeth and a wicked pointed tongue, a mouth ready to snap shut on my face. I bet if there's really a treasure, it's in there, Ethan said, reaching for the clasp to open the chest. Grace wandered over to join them, but I stayed where I was, afraid to move. This all felt wrong for some reason. I wanted to scream at him to stop, but 
Before I could, there was a loud noise behind me as the trap door slammed shut, sealing us inside the attic. What the fuck? I muttered, going over to it and trying to push it open. The trap door wouldn't budge. Hey, are you up there? I heard Harold's voice call from below. But that didn't make any sense. Harold had been the one making the noise in the attic. We'd heard the loud thud from up here and assumed it was him. But if he was down below us, then who the hell had made that noise? Yeah, the trap door's stuck. Can you pull that rope and let us out? I asked. There's a chest up here. I heard him moving around, the floorboard squeaking beneath his feet as he searched for something. Yo, it's too high up. I need something to stand on, he said, his squeaking footsteps getting quieter as he walked away. I looked down at the trap door and realized that the ladder we had climbed up was attached to the hatch, so that the steps dropped down when the door opened. I kept thinking about how it was open when we found it, so we had just assumed it was Harold that had climbed up here and made the noise. But if it wasn't him... A loud thud broke the silence behind me and I spun around, seeing I was now alone in the attic. Not funny, guys, I said to the empty room. Seriously, this is so not funny. But no one replied. No one burst out laughing or let out a stifled giggle, covered by a friend's hand. There was no indication that this was a joke at all. Instead, I got a very bad feeling as I stood there, surveying the dusty, empty space of the attic around me, and breathing in that awful stink like dusty vinegar. My heartbeat was so loud and heavy I could hear it in my ears. A dull, thudding bass drum playing double time. Very clever. Hide in the spooky haunted attic. So original. You guys can come out now, I said, hating the strained, worried sound of my voice. Nobody said a word. Then I heard Harold speak again from below me. Yeah, who are you talking to, man? I rolled my eyes. Uh, how many of those beers did you drink? We're all up here, dude. There was a brief silence, and then Ethan spoke up. But now it sounded like he was right next to Harold, below me. His voice muffled by the floorboards. Dude, you're the one who's drunk. We're all down here, dummy. My heart skipped a beat as I tried to wrap my mind around this. But then I looked around and saw a side hallway which branched off from the main section of the attic. Great, I thought to myself. So they found a staircase or a laundry chute or something and snuck down there without me noticing. Very clever, guys. Suddenly the trap door opened and I looked down to see the faces of Harold, Grace, Ethan, and Audrey. Harold was standing on a chair and had managed to finally reach the string to pull the trap door open. But there was someone else standing with them as well. A freckled girl about my age who was slim with red hair and a dimpled smile. Who the hell are you? I asked before going down the stairs. Everyone laughed except for the red-haired girl who looked a bit hurt. You're such a dumbass, Audrey said, smiling. Yes, he most certainly is, said the redhead, scowling. It would almost be funny if it weren't. Get your ass down here, dude. Let's explore the rest of the shithole and see if we can find that treasure. I climbed down the stairs and asked, What, so there was nothing in the trunk? The five of them just laughed. Nothing but some old bones, said Audrey, her eyes looking darker than I remembered. That's weird. Who keeps old bones in a treasure chest? Hoarders, probably, said Harold. Come on, let's get going. Maybe the treasure's in the basement. That sentence made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The basement? I didn't want to see what the lower level of this place looked like. I wanted to get out of here, to be honest. I was just embarrassed to admit it. And who the fuck was this chick? She was just standing there, looking at me like it was perfectly natural for her to be here. Was she a friend of Audrey's? That was the only thing I could think of. Her face didn't look familiar, but she was acting like she knew me. The only thing that occurred to me was that maybe I had met her at a party or something and I had forgotten. But it seemed unlikely. Maybe at Tanner's place? My mom said we can use it, but only if we clean up after ourselves. Jason's going to talk to his parents about boring their car, so we can go up on Friday and come back Monday, if that works for you guys. She was talking to Audrey, and Harold was nodding along, but I had no idea what they were referring to, even though my name had been mentioned. Or was she talking about a different Jason? And who the fuck was this chick? Sorry, I must have missed something, I said, and they all stopped talking and looked at me. Have we met before? 
I'm so confused right now. After two or three seconds of awkward silence, Audrey started talking again as if I hadn't spoken. Yeah, that should work for us. I mean, I'll have to ask someone to switch shifts with me on Monday, but if I can't find anyone, I'll just come back a day early. Ethan nudged me in the ribs. Smooth, dude. Keep it up, she's gonna dump you, man. It's really not funny. What's up with you anyways? You look a little gray. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back from the rest of the group. Okay, seriously, you're freaking me out with this bullshit. Just tell me who the fuck that girl is with the red hair. He paused and looked at me with newfound concern. Shit, you're serious, aren't you? Yes, I've been trying to tell you. I've never seen that girl before in my life. He frowned and looked me in the eyes for a long time. Then a slow smile spread across his face. Oh man, you almost had me there. Come on, dumbass, let's go. We're gonna lose him. As terrifying as all this was, the idea of being separated from the group again was even scarier. Unless... A voice in my mind spoke up suddenly. Unless you've been separated from the group this whole time. Ever since the attic. I thought about that thud and how the group of three people had just disappeared. Vanished like a magic trick only to reemerge downstairs again. I thought of Harold disappearing and the loud thud that had attracted us up to the attic. Have you ever considered the possibility that your life isn't real? That it's all an elaborate dream or a simulation in some supercomputer? Have you ever considered that your memories and your life could all be a series of zeros and ones strewn together to create false impressions? Digital foolery? Families and friends, jobs and hobbies and vacations to the beach? All just implanted false memories? That was how I felt at that moment. That horrible, vertigo-stricken moment when I stumbled backwards and put my hand to my temple and groaned. I felt like these might not really be my friends at all, but mimics. They all turned to look at me, seeing that I wasn't walking with them anymore. What's wrong? They asked in unison. Sorry, I must have tripped. Let me get this straight. So you're my girlfriend? The redhead sauntered over to me, her hips swaying side to side in a way that made me picture her naked. What can I say? I'm a teenager. Even if this was creepy as hell, she was hot. Of course I'm your girlfriend. You must have hit your head somewhere and got a concussion, poor baby. She put her hand up to the side of my face and cupped my cheek with her palm. Looking down into her eyes, I felt my knees go a little weak. Could I be wrong? Maybe I hit my head or I had a mental lapse and... I wanted to believe it so badly. Up until that moment, I don't, I don't think I realized how lonely I truly was. But then I noticed how dark her irises were. Despite the shadows, I should have been able to see some color in them. But instead, they were black as a starless midnight sky. How did we meet? I asked, nervously trying to create space between us. At the party, silly, she said and seemed to sense I was backing away from her. Tanner's place. I took another step back and her eyes darkened even further. My friends joined her on both sides, flanking her two on the left and two on the right. The five of them stared at me with blank looks on their faces, waiting for me to react. There was no denying it now that they were standing side by side. They all had the same black eyes, the same dead gazes, the same thinly veiled smiles rising at the corners to reveal too many teeth crammed into mouths too small. You're not them. The words escaped my lips and in an instant they changed. Lightning flashed outside, booming with a loud crack rattling the old house in its weathered bones. In the blue-tinged light of that thunder, their faces appeared decayed and zombie-like. Worms and millipedes crawled in and out of jagged cracks in their pockmarked gray flesh. I heard rain pattering down on the roof a second later, and then it began to fall torrentially, the downpour almost deafening. And as the darkness settled in once again, their faces returned to their previous shapes, attempting but failing to look like my friends. I tried to turn away and ran, but realized that my wrist was being gripped firmly by the red-haired girl. She smiled at me, baring her teeth, and laughed. Stay, she said. This is what you always wanted. Admit it. Your own girlfriend, so that you're no longer the fifth wheel? The house knows what you want. It can make it for you. All you have to do is stay. For a split second, I actually felt an urge to listen to her to give in. 
It felt like someone was whispering persuasively in my ear, telling me to go along with it. I would no longer feel lonely. I would finally have what I always wanted. I could picture us living happily together here in this house forever and ever. But then the lightning flashed outside again, a strobe light casting the room in a momentary blue light. Her face changed and her disguise slipped, revealing that hideous dead visage again. No, I said, twisting and fighting against her grip. No, what the fuck did you do to my friends? I kicked out desperately with one leg, trying to knock her off me in any way possible. It worked, but she raked her nails across my forearm in the process, and I felt blood trickling down as I stumbled away and ran. Looking back, I saw the five of them just standing there, not following me, as if they didn't have to. I raced back up the stairs towards the attic, hoping desperately that I wasn't too late. The ladder was waiting for me, and I pulled out my phone and turned on the light, bolting up the steps. At that moment, I wasn't worried about my own safety. I was only worried about my friends. I had been a fool to believe those imposters, even for a second. And I was blaming myself for whatever horrors were happening to my friends. Once I was back up in that foul-smelling air again, I found myself staring across the space towards that treasure chest. That thing had my friends. It had opened its mouth wide like a mimic and it had snatched them up, crunching their bones between its long, sharp teeth. What was in there? I had asked the imposters. Just some old bones, they had answered. And I had the feeling that would be exactly what I would find if I looked inside. Thud. I looked back and saw the trap door had slammed shut behind me. The house had sealed me up here. And now I was trapped with that thing. Thud. I spun around to see the chest was closer now, as if it had taken a leaping jump towards me. No. I whispered. No, it's not possible. But it was possible. And as it took another bounding leap towards me, I saw the trunk open up. And inside was a twisted mass of human bodies, wailing in agony, their limbs entangled and their faces frozen in screams of horror and pain. I saw Ethan's face and Audrey's before it slammed shut again. Those long, sharp teeth, just like I had imagined, were there as well, ready to snap shut on me and trap me inside. Thud. It leapt closer. I only had a few moments left before it would be on me, and I would likely be dead. But what the hell could I do? The window. It was my only chance, but the problem was it was on the other side of the chest. I would have one opportunity to make this work, but if I failed, I would surely die. Thud. As it landed even closer to me, I could smell that horrible stink coming off it. And I realized the chest was what was emitting that smell like a bodily odor. That nasty, dusty vinegar stink was pungent and reminded me of chemicals, like the smell of a dog after it had been skunked. I had been timing the creature's movements, and when it took its final leaping bound towards me, I rolled it out of the way, hearing it crash with a loud bang into the wall behind me a moment later. The creature relied on surprise to catch its victims unaware. It wasn't used to a prey that knew its real identity, and that was the only thing that had saved me. I knew it wasn't what it looked like, I knew it was a mimic, just like this entire house. This place was just a facade, a, a mask hiding a monster. Unfortunately, my friends weren't so lucky. Running towards the window, I took one look back over my shoulder and saw my friends trying to escape from the creature's open maw as it struggled to recover from slamming into the wall. Unfortunately, they were too badly dismembered and only made it a few inches before being slurped back up into the creature's enormous mouth like Vietnamese noodles. I heard them pounding against it from the inside, but it made no difference. The creature was coming at me again. Faster now. Thud, 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 thud. And I found myself racing as quickly as I could across the rickety wooden floorboards of the attic, and then diving head first out the window like a stunt actor. The glass shattered and broke all around me, and I was sliced up badly, but I wouldn't feel those cuts until later at the hospital. My adrenaline was in overdrive, and it was running the show. Pain would come later. I landed on the second floor roof and rolled down onto the overhang which protected the porch from rain. If not for that overhang, I would have likely died, impaled on the spiked wrought iron fence which encircled the garden. At least, that's what I always imagine in my mind's eye. Often I have nightmares where I land on that fence and it skewers me like a shish kebab, and then the house swallows me whole, the entire front of it opening up like a giant mouth full of long, sharp teeth. Thunder and lightning boomed overhead as I stood on shaky legs in the rain. 
I looked around, trying to figure out how it would get down from the roof, which covered the porch. My eyes darted around feverishly, landing on something that was not helpful. Inside the house, through one of the first floor windows, I could see Harold. It looked like he had never made it up to the attic at all. He'd gone off to find somewhere to piss, and the house had gotten him. The walls of the room he was in were devouring him like an oversized Venus flytrap. He was being absorbed into it, and I had no doubt the house would spit out his bones like date pits once he was dead. It could change into whatever it wanted, like a shapeshifter. The house was alive. A larger version of that creature in the attic. But the house needed food. So it waited for prey to come to it. And then it separated its victims and consumed them one by one. I leapt off the roof of the enclosed porch, fearing that the tiles would turn to quicksand beneath my feet in any second, keeping me prisoner there. But they didn't. I landed in the branches of a nearby tree and climbed down from there, nearly losing my grip several times and almost winding up skewered on the garden fence below. Once I was down on solid ground, I ran. I bolted home through the lightning and the rain and told my parents what had happened. That all my friends were dead. The Lakewind house had gotten them. Of course, no one believed me. I was checked into a hospital and then a mental institution after my friends were never found. And everyone thought I killed them. Especially considering my batshit story. I obtained the nickname Psycho, which stuck around even after being cleared in court. And that moniker stayed with me until college. My face was in the papers and online, and it was hard to avoid being recognized. People walking past me on the street who I'd never even met would whisper after I'd gone by, though never to my face. And the words were always the same. Psycho. Killer. Murderer. Eventually, the press died down, and I went on with my life. It took a long time for things to go back to normal, but... Finally, I managed to move on. I have kids of my own now, and they're getting to the age where they're too old to be going out trick-or-treating. They want to go out and have other kinds of fun now. More mature fun. I try to be a good father. I try to tell them to be careful. I tell them never to go out urban exploring. To stay out of abandoned houses. But kids will be kids. It's a good thing we moved far away from Lakewind Drive. Tonight's story was co-written by Jesse Pullins. Jesse has a new book out. It's titled Seasonal Halloween Store, and it's available on Amazon. I'll include a link in the description below. And this book features a lot of really great Reddit No Sleep authors, people that you're probably familiar with, GTrip14, Girl from the Crypt, uh, myself, a bunch of other awesome writers, Blair Daniels. So I hope you'll check out, check out this book and uh, look at the description below for more information. I'm very proud to be featured in this book, and I hope you all enjoy it. Thanks, have a great night. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Sewall, Cheryl James, Picker Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mama Cotto, Dante Kincaid, Zaren Ray, Angela Donovan, Larian 50 Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Burt Turner, Vajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, and That Darn Fox. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you, which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope you please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.